Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So here we are again for another reading of the Granth Raj Shimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, we're being joined by a special guest whose birthday it'll be on Monday the 14th, Valentine's yeah. Day. So if you want to fall in love with anyone, you should fall in love with him. Very yeah. handsome lad, isn't he? Yeah. Who is it? It is. Yeah. If you know who it is, you can put it in the thing. Comments below. In the comments below, yes. <laughs> Okay. okay, so it's Canto 3, chapter 21, text 48. I think we should be able to finish this chapter. Well, let's see. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya It's in sync. In the sink. Something's in the sink. Text 48. Seeing that the monarch had come to his hermitage, 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 <laughs> and was bowing before him, the sage greeted him with benediction and received him with due honour. Okay, you want to help set the scene in case... Someone's... Not really, because I think Prabhupada sets it, but okay. All right, go ahead then. <laughs> Papa. Emperor Sly and Bhuva Manu not only approached the cottage of dried leaves possessed by the hermit Kardama, but also offered respectful obeisances unto him. Similarly, it was the duty of the hermit <laughs> um, to offer blessings to kings who used to approach his hermitage in the jungle. Jeepers. In the jungle. So, yes, prospective father-in-law is paying obeisances to the hermit Kardama Muni in his jungle home made of leaves. Text 49. After receiving the sage's attention, the king sat down and was silent. Recalling the instructions of the Lord, Kardama then spoke to the king as follows, delighting him with his sweet accents. <laughs> Text 50. The tour you have undertaken, O Lord, is surely intended to protect the virtuous and kill the demons since you embody the protecting energy of Sri Hari, purport. It appears from many Vedic literatures, especially histories like Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas, that the pious kings of old used to tour their kingdom in order to give protection to the pious citizens and to chastise or kill the impious. Sometimes they used to kill animals in the forest to practice the killing art because without such practice they would not be able to kill the undesirable elements. Kshatriyas are allowed to commit violence in that way because violence for a good purpose is a part of their duty. Interesting. <laughs> Here two terms are clearly mentioned. Vidaya, for the purpose of killing, and Asatam, those who are undesirable. The protecting energy of the king is supposed to be the energy of the Supreme Lord. In Bhagavad Gita 4.8, the Lord says, Paritranaya sadunam vinashaya chiduskritam. The Lord descends to give protection to the pious and to kill the demons. Therefore, the potency to give protection to the pious and kill the demons or undesirables is directly an energy of the Supreme Lord. And the king or the chief executive of the state is supposed to possess such energy. In this age, it is very difficult to find such a head of state who is expert in killing the undesirables. Modern heads of state sit very nicely in their palaces and try without reason to kill innocent persons. Interesting. So, uh... Yeah, very powerful purport statements about the rule or the role of the ruler or leader 
mm. that he's meant to protect the citizens, and he would tour around in order to do that, and he would remove the undesirables. Um, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do because we all want to be liked by everybody, and um, you know, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, it's like in the modern day, it's like, yeah, it's easier to attack the innocent people, as Prabhupada is saying. Mm. The leaders attack the innocent, and then mm. they kind of avoid dealing with the the real miscreants, I guess, to some extent. Yeah, interesting point. It's a grown-up version of schoolyard bullies, politicians, because generally bullies will go after the weaker link, and if someone turns around and stands up to them, most times there it's not the same bravado, you know. So in the same way, leaders, without getting political, <laughs> but if you look at who they go after and who they try to take down, it isn't. You know, I won't name countries, but some countries get away with things I'm saying. <laughs> you know, some they just no, we don't go there or we don't show we don't go in there and invade invade that country and take down the leader <coughs> and the dictator. They just know that ain't happening. So like a grown up version of bullies, they go for the weaker link. I think it's your next right. Oh, I thought you might have a comment. Oh wow. <laughs> Text 51, you assume when necessary the part of the sun god, the moon god Agni, the god of fire, Indra, the lord of paradise, Vayu, the wind god, Yama, the god, the god of punishment, Dharma, the god of piety and Varuna, the god presiding over the waters. All obeisances to you who are none other than Lord Vishnu. Popo. Since the sage Kardama was a Brahmana and Swayambhuva was a Kshatriya, the sage was not supposed to offer obeisances to the king because socially his position was greater than the king's. But he offered his obeisances to Swayambhuva Manu because as Manu, king and emperor, he was the representative of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is always worshipable, regardless of whether one is a Brahmana, a Kshatriya or a Shudra. As the representative of the Supreme Lord, the king deserved respectful obeisances from everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder how that applies to modern day monarchy. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't because there's hardly any modern day monarchy. Really. Yeah. But in modern day monarchy, that's also there. I guess even the Queen of England, you know, she theoretically gets a certain level of respect. I mean, mm -hmm. she still lives in a palace and mm. comes and goes as she pleases and mm. has her role to play in the governmental affairs. And, mm. you know, when people see her, they curtsy, you know, in a certain way or whatever they do. So, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because this is an ancient custom that is hardly seen in the modern day because mm -hmm. it's considered outdated. Mm. Uh, 52 and 54, 52 through 54. If you did not mount your victorious jeweled chariot whose mere presence threatens culprits, if you did not produce fierce sounds by the twanging of your bow, if you did not roam about the world like the brilliant sun, leading a huge army whose trampling feet caused the globe of the earth to tremble, then all the moral laws governing the varnas and ashrams created by the Lord himself would be broken by the rogues and rascals. Purport. It is the duty of a responsible king to protect the social and spiritual orders in human society. The spiritual orders are divided into four ashrams, brahmachari, grihasta, vanaprastha, and sannyas. And the social orders, according to the work and qualification, are made up of the Brahmanas, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. These social orders, according to the different grades of work and qualification, are described in Bhagavad Gita. Unfortunately, for want of proper protection by responsible kings, the system of social and spiritual orders has now become a hereditary caste system. But this is not the actual system. 
human society means that society which is making progress towards spiritual realization. The most advanced human society was known as Arya. Arya refers to those who are advancing. So the question is, which society is advancing? Advancement does not mean creating material necessities unnecessarily and thus wasting human energy in aggravation over so-called material comforts. Real advancement is advancement towards spiritual realization and the community which acted toward this end was known as the Aryan civilization. So I'll just read that. Real advancement is advancement towards spiritual realization. So mm-hmm. that's the real advancement. The intelligent men, the Brahmanas, as exemplified by Kardama Muni, were engaged in advancing the spiritual cause, and the Kshatriyas, like Emperor Swayambhuva, used to rule the country and ensure that all facilities for spiritual realization were nicely provided. It is the duty of the king to travel all over the country and see that everything is in order. <clears throat> Indian civilization, on the basis of the four Varnas and Ashrams, deteriorated because of her dependency on foreigners or those who did not follow the civilization of Varnashram. Thus, the Varnashram system has now been degraded into the Mm. caste system. Mm -hmm. The institution of four Varnas and four Ashrams is confirmed herewith to be Bhagavat Rachita, which means designed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Bhagavad Gita, this is also confirmed, Chato Varnyam Maya Sritam. The Lord says that the institution of four varnas and four ashrams is created by me. Anything created by the Lord cannot be closed or covered. The divisions of varnas and ashrams will continue to exist, either in their original form or in degraded form. But because they are created by the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they cannot be extinguished. They are like the sun, a creation of God, and therefore will remain. Either covered by clouds or in a clear sky, the sun will continue to exist. Similarly, when the Varnashram system becomes degraded, it appears as a hereditary caste system. But in every society, there is an intelligent class of men, a martial class, a mercantile class and a labourer class. When they are regulated for cooperation among communities, according to the Vedic principles, then there is peace and spiritual advancement. But when there is hatred and malpractice and mutual distrust in the caste system, the whole system becomes degraded, and as stated herein, it creates a deplorable state. At the present moment, the entire world is in this deplorable condition because of giving rights to so many interests. This is due to the degradation of the four castes of Varnas and Ashram. Thoughts? Mm. Everyone has their place in society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Text 55. I have lots of thoughts on this, but I'm not going to say any of them just so we can finish the chapter, okay? Hmm? Text 55. If you gave up all thought of the world's situation, unrighteousness would flourish. For men who hanker only after money would be unopposed. Such miscreants would attack and the world would perish. Purport. Because the scientific division of four varnas and four ashrams is now being extinguished, the entire world is being governed by unwanted men who have no training in religion, politics, or social order, and it is in a very deplorable condition. In the institution of four varnas and four ashrams, there are regular training principles for the different classes of men. 
just as in the modern age there is a necessity for engineers, medical practitioners, and electricians, and they are properly trained in different scientific institutions. Similarly, in former times, the higher social orders, namely the intelligent class, the brahmanas, the ruling class, the kshatriyas, the mercantile class, the vaishas, were properly trained. Bhagavad Gita describes the duties of the brahmanas, kshatriyas, vaishas, and shudras. When there is no such training, one simply claims that because he is born in a brahman or kshatriya family, he is therefore a brahman or a kshatriya, even though he performs the duties of a shudra. Such undue claims to such undue claims to being a higher caste man make the system of, sci- of scientific social orders into a caste system, completely degrading the original system. So basically, the Varnashram system is um, founded on the principle that one has certain uh, guna and karma, certain qualities and certain activities. Um, that makes it a clear scientific system of Varna and Ashram. But if one is just saying, I'm born in a Brahmin family, or I'm born in a Kshatriya family, even though my guna and karma, my qualities and my activities are that of a different social order, um, then it just becomes a caste system. And why is it called caste system? Because, you know, it's come. it's just about what family you're born in. So that becomes your caste. But that's not what the original system was based on. Thus society is now in chaos, and there is neither peace nor prosperity. It is clearly stated herein that unless there is the vigilance of a strong king, and pious unqualified men will claim a certain status in society, and that will make the social order perish. So, part of that system was meant that there had to be a strong king someone who would, as we heard earlier, basically punish the miscreants um, and protect the citizens. Otherwise, as it mentions here, those people who are just after wealth will come and pillage um, everything and thus society perishes. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Text 56. In spite of all this, I ask you, O valiant king, the purpose of which you have come here, Whatever it may be, we shall carry it out without reservation. When a guest comes to a friend's house, it is understood that there is some special purpose. Cardinal Muni could understand that such a great king as Wayambuva, although travelling to inspect the condition of his kingdom, must have had some special purpose to come to his hermitage. Thus he prepared himself to to fulfil the king's desire. Formerly it was customary that the sages used to go to the kings and the kings used to visit the sages in their hermitage. Each was glad to fulfill the other's purpose. This reciprocal relationship is called Bhakti Karya. There is a nice verse describing the relationship of mutual beneficial interest between the Brahmana and the Kshatriya. Shataram Dvijatvam Shataram means the royal order and Dvijatvam means the Brahminical order. The two were meant for mutual interest. The royal order would give protection to the brahmanas for the cultivation of spiritual advancement in society, and the brahmanas would give their valuable instruction to the royal order on how the state and the citizens can gradually be elevated in spiritual perfection. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the third canto, 21st chapter, of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Conversation Between Manu and Kardama. So there you go, we finished chapter 21 of the third canto. And it was a long chapter, but very exciting, very instructive, so many powerful points. And now we're at the stage where Kardama Muni and Swayambhuva Manu are about to have a conversation. And what is that conversation going to be about? Maybe just the don't. Don't do a spoiler alert, it's a cliffhanger. Okay, so we'll see you all next time. (laughs) And don't forget, on Valentine's Day, there's a special appearance 
Hopefully you're not watching this after Valentine's Day. Of course it might be. I think we're a bit ahead of the game, aren't we? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but if not, you can still tell us who is this exalted person behind us. <laughs> Write it in the comments. So like, subscribe, and comment. comment. All right. See you all later. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Bhagavatam. Ki Jai. Jai.